We're going to read a lot of scripture this morning. And, um, you know, I'll tell you, um, we talked last week about being a bunch of little Jesuses in here. And, um, you know, my heart is for us all to be the church in a way that there's full participation on Sunday mornings with what's going on in the room by everybody. And that's why, you know, that's why we're having different people open in prayer in the morning. And that's why um, we're doing psalm readings from different people. And it, I, I'm really blessed when other people use their giftings in the church. And, but just having the, there's a gifting that's in your life. And God's put it in there. And the Bible says that we have giftings so that we can edify one another. And so your gifting is there because you have a responsibility to use it. And I'm telling you that you have a gift inside of you that God's put there for a reason. And if you don't know what that is, that's okay. But you should ask him. Because he's the one that he wants to have. You're the one that he wants to have that gift. And he's put you in that place for a reason, okay? So that's none of my notes, that's for free. Um, but, but that's my heart, is that everybody would participate as part of the body and, and as a living organism, that we would lift one another up with the giftings that God's placed in our lives, amen? Uh, the disciples were first called Christians at Antioch. And that's sort of the theme that we've been talking about, is that if you're a Christian here this morning, you're a disciple of Jesus Christ. And, and that's an interesting turn of phrase because when we start talking about Jesus' disciples, we think of these um, 12 guys. 11 were good, one was bad. And those are his disciples. But guess what? You are also disciples of Jesus Christ. And, and, and that means something. That means something. If we're, if we're a disciple, that means that we are disciples so that we can learn to do what Jesus did and learn to be who Jesus is, right? And we we talked last week about imagining Jesus in our lives, and I think it really captured my imagination and and, and some some of you guys too. If we think about what do I do in my life? If I'm a mailman, what does Jesus look like as a mailman? Uh, If if I'm the father of children and, and, and I have a wife, what does Jesus look like as a husband and as a father? And so if I picture Jesus in my life, how would Jesus do me differently than I'm doing me? And that's what we're growing into in, in our walk. I think it, you know, Jesus at the supermarket, Jesus at the dentist, Jesus picking his kids up from school, Jesus teaching at the school. Wouldn't it be awesome if Jesus was teaching in our schools? Well, guess what? He is. Jesus is represented in our schools. Someone texted me this week, and, and uh, he was really excited, and he says, I'm seeing little Jesuses everywhere. I'm seeing Jesuses in flannel with trucker hats, and I'm seeing Jesuses in suits, and that's what it should be like. And really, this is just a different way to say that Jesus is inside of us, right? We're all filled with the Holy Spirit, and we have a treasure in jars of clay that we take around with us, and so everywhere that we go, there God is, but it's, it's fun to picture Jesus, like I said, like I, uh, seeing, looking out on the church and just seeing a whole bunch of Jesuses sitting in the congregation looking at me. It's fun. I, I, I want to be more like Jesus. Amen? I want Jesus to shine through my life everywhere that I go and everything that I do. And, and, and I'm on that journey. And I think last week I said, You know, if somebody came up to me and said, I'm just like Jesus, I would have some red flags, right? There's something wrong with this guy. But if someone came up and said, I want to be like Jesus, I'd be like, brother, I don't want to be like Jesus too. And and that would resonate with me. So one of the ways that we do that is we read Scripture. We read about who He is, and, and it's not just information but it's the living word that we get down inside of our lives and it changes us and and we spend time with him and the holy spirit and in his presence and we spend time around other people who the bible says are the aroma of life to us that we're the aroma of christ 
And to some who aren't saved, we're the aroma of death, but to each other, we're the aroma of life. And so we come together and are encouraged, encouraged and built up by the giftings that God's placed in the body. And so we're changed. I was reading the scripture this, this week, and, and I wanted to read to you as we open this morning a scripture that, that changed me this week, that I sort of bumped up against and I wrestled with, and, and I uh, was changed by in, in some small way this week. And it's in uh, Matthew chapter 23. It says, Then Jesus said to the crowds and his disciples, The teachers of the law and the Pharisees sit in the seat of Moses. So you must be careful to do everything they tell you, but do not do what they do, for they do not practice what they preach. They tie up heavy, cumbersome loads and put them on other people's shoulders, but they themselves are not willing to lift a finger to move them. Everything they do is done for people to see. They make their phylacteries wide and their tassels on their garments long. They love the place of honor at banquets and the most important seats at synagogues. They love to be greeted with respect in the marketplaces and to be called rabbi by others. And here's this next section of scripture that that really shines a light on the church and I feel like that, that the church could learn a lot from. It says, but you, and he's talking to his disciples and he's talking to the people that are following him. You are not to be called rabbi for you have one teacher and you are all brothers. Do not call anyone on earth father, for you have one father, and he is in heaven. Nor are you to be called instructors, for you have one instructor, the Messiah. The greatest among you will be your servant, for those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. I think we have this idea of what mature Christianity looks like. Like if, if Christianity had levels, next level Christianity has this picture in our mind and we think of somebody who's super anointed and talking to thousands and is impactful and powerful. But maybe mature Christianity isn't someone that can argue their viewpoint really well or, or isn't the iconic Christian figures that, that we might think of, but maybe Mature Christianity is humility. Uh, Mature Christianity is not seeking the high position of respect. Maybe mature Christianity is being a humble servant. Maybe mature Christianity is putting others before ourselves. I, I think that when you talk about mature Christianity, when you start seeing that in your life, it's when you start seeing the character of Christ start to shine through who you are. Amen? We are disciples of Jesus. As we spend time with him, he teaches us how to be more like him. Sometimes it's really challenging, but it's always really good. Can you guys feel the change that's happening in your life as Christians? Can you feel the work that he's been doing over the years to change you to be more like him? Are you the same person that you were five years ago? It's always really good. And that's what it's about. That's what being a disciple is all about. So, one of the things we're going to do is reading these different encounters with Jesus and taking lessons from them over the next several weeks because we want to know who Jesus is because we have a heart's desire to be more like him. And this morning, that reading is going to be out of Matthew 14, starting in verse 13. In this scripture, Jesus had just heard that, that John the Baptist was killed. And um, he died in a pretty gruesome way. He was beheaded at the whim of a snotty teenage girl, probably. The way the story goes, she danced really well, and the king wanted to give her a favor. And she said, I want the head of John the Baptist on a platter. And so this guy who dedicated his life to the Lord from a young age and spent his, his young years in the wilderness, who 
gave everything he had to his Father in heaven, was killed in such a disrespectful way. So when we find ourselves in verse 13, Jesus had just found out what happened to John. When Jesus heard what had happened, he withdrew by boat privately to a solitary place. Hearing of this, the crowds followed him on foot from the towns. When Jesus landed and saw a large crowd, he had compassion on them and healed the sick. So it moves really past fast the need that Jesus had for a solitary moment. But that part of the story resonates with me so much that I, I get hung up on it. So John the Baptist was Jesus' cousin. They probably saw each other on feast days. They knew each other. There's, it's thought that they probably didn't spend a lot of time together and he didn't, John the Baptist says, I, I know not who this is, but, but I don't know what that is. Mary visited Elizabeth when she was pregnant and they had encounters with each other and here was, they were serving the Lord together and here was a friend and a cousin of Jesus. And so Jesus hears that he's dead and, and he needed a minute. He sought to be alone. It says, when Jesus heard what had happened, he withdrew by boat privately to a solitary place. There's three words here that really stick out to me. Withdrew, privately, and solitary. And there's times that I can relate with that, you guys, where, where I've reached my saturation point with people and with things that are going on and the things that are happening in my life and I need a minute alone. And Jesus needed that. I think he wanted some time to mourn his friend. But when he landed in this solitary place, instead of finding some time to himself, he found a large group of people, by the thousands, actually. Because they all heard what was going on, and I just imagine this is a point in Jesus' life where everywhere that he went, there were crowds. And if you guys are anything like me, I can do that for a little while. But sometimes I need a minute to myself. And it said Jesus withdrew to solitary places a lot. He practiced doing that. But when he needed that moment, the solitary he places he goes to, to hang out is filled with thousands of people. Most of you have probably experienced this before. Experienced the need to get away from people and to have a moment to yourself, but because of the situation or the circumstance or what's going on, there's nowhere for you to turn to have that moment. And there's something that draws on something in you that you really don't have to pay. Jesus, needing to get away to a solitary place, saw the crowds and had compassion on them and healed their sick. So Jesus, when he pulls up in this boat to this solitary place, sees thousands of people, sets aside his own need for seclusion and ministers and serves the thousands of people that are there and heals their sick. That's Jesus, you guys. Jesus putting aside self once again to minister to the multitudes. I want to pause for a moment as we're looking at this scripture because this, all this we're talking about is this, this idea that we want to be more like Jesus. We want to see what Jesus is doing and we want to be more like him. So it's easy for us to look at this, uh, me especially, because I'm a very practical person, and for me to say, okay, what I see Jesus doing is putting aside self so he can minister to the multitudes. But if we jump 
to that conclusion and we, we camp out on that and we drill in on that, we, we're missing a very important piece of this story. When Jesus saw the crowds that came to meet him, he had compassion on them. We can't jump past the compassion word into just the things that Jesus did. That word compassion means that there was a moving in him. He was moved in his heart by the multitudes of people that he saw. He had compassion. Why? Because he loved them. So, so it, it, he loved these people. And so, yeah, he had a need when he pulled up on the boat. But seeing all those people, his desire became to heal their sick because he had compassion for them. He loved them. Here's a key component of this. We want to be more like Jesus. When we see people that are hurting and that need healing and that need Jesus, is there something in us that moves? Does it move us? I think that, that I know you guys, and I think that, yeah, there is. There is something that, that moves. But I think it's also healthy to ask ourselves, do we love people? 1 John 4 8 says, Whoever does not love does not know God, because God is love. Later on in that same chapter, it says, We love because he first loved us. How do we become more like Jesus? How do we become more like Jesus in the way that we're moved for people? We spend time in our life being loved by Jesus. So this, this idea to be transformed and to become more like Jesus isn't just let me write down all the things that Jesus did and go do those and I'll be more like Jesus, but there's a transformative work that happens in our life when we experience Jesus in us. When we are loved by Him, we love because He first loved us. We learn how to love when we experience His love. Without experiencing His love, we don't even know what love is. We have versions of it, but it's different than what He loves us with. When you listen to Jesus' teachings, you begin to learn that it isn't really about making sure you do all of the law. It's not really about making sure that you accomplish all the tasks. What you start to learn is that there has to be a transformative work in our heart. That He has to take our heart of stone and give us a heart of flesh. I, I, I put this example in here in Matthew 5, part of the Beatitudes. Verse 21, it says, You have heard that it was said to people long ago, You shall not murder, and anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. But I tell you, that anyone who is angry with a brother or sister will be subject to judgment. He's not, his purpose in saying this isn't to make a new law for us and, and okay, add being angry on the list, guys, because we can't do that either. That's not his point. He's, what he's communicating here is it's not enough to just check the law off in its little boxes. You need a circumcised heart in your life. God has to remove the hardness that's in your heart and replace your heart of stone with a heart of flesh. And that's a theme throughout all of Jesus' teachings is it's not really about what you do. It's about your heart and why you do it. And so when we start talking about, about this encounter with Jesus, and we start talking about being more like Jesus, the reason I'm spending so much time here is because it's more than just reading about what Jesus did and doing those things. There is a transformation that happens in our lives by being in and around Him that changes the way that we act. 
And you can't have one without the other. It's kind of like a tree and fruit. It's like, it's like if, if the tree is your heart, it produces a certain kind of fruit in your life. Right? If the tree is rotten, what does the Bible say? A bad tree, an unhealthy tree, can't produce good fruit. And it also says a healthy tree can't produce bad fruit. So it's not really about just checking all the fruit off and, 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 and picking the fruit. you got to make sure that the thing that's going on inside your heart is healthy. And the way that that changes and is transformed is that we spend time around Jesus. We read about Him and we eat the Word and we put it inside of us and we do it. So back to Matthew 14. Jesus had just put aside His own wants and chose to be a source for the people serving them. So Matthew 14, verse 15 says this. As evening approached, the disciples came to him and said, this is a remote place. It's a remote place because Jesus was trying to get away from everybody. This is a remote place and it's already getting late. Send the crowds away so they can go to the villages and buy themselves some food. Verse 16, Jesus replied, they don't need to go away. You give them something to eat. We have here only five loaves of bread and two fish, they answered. Bring them here to me, he said. And he directed the people to sit down on the grass, taking the five loaves and the two fish. Looking up to heaven, he gave thanks and broke the loaves. Then he gave them to the disciples, and the disciples gave them to the people. They all ate and were satisfied, and the disciples picked up 12 baskets of, of broken pieces that were left over. The number of those who ate was about 5,000 men besides women and children. Like a good master that he is, like a good teacher in our lives, Jesus is teaching his disciples to, to do what he does. Jesus put aside self to be a source to the people. And he gives this example. And then when the disciples say that the people need something, send them away so they can get it. He says they don't need to go away. You be a source to the people. You feed them. It can be overwhelming sometimes when God calls me to pour out into other people's lives. And I, I'm sure you guys feel the same, that it can be overwhelming when God puts people in your lives and, and you pour yourself out into them. And it's easy for me to feel like I don't have the resources to give away that he's asking me for. Just like the disciples, I feel like saying, Lord, all I have is five loaves and two fish. I don't have the resources that you're requiring of me. Lord, I would love to serve in ministry. I just don't have the time. Lord, I would love to do what you're asking me to do. I don't have the energy. And it's true. In myself, I don't have the resources that it would take to be a source to other people. But when I give what I have to the Lord, He can use it to do amazing things. The point isn't for us to do it. The point is for us to partner with the Lord in the doing of it. And you will be amazed when you give your resources to the Lord how He can multiply them and give them and break them apart and you'll have more left over than you had going into it. Amen? Worship team, could you come forward, please? There's one last scripture I want to read to you guys out of John. <laughs> this is John 4. Verse 1, and this is, this is Jesus talking to the Samaritan woman. Now Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard that He was gaining and baptizing more disciples than John. Although in fact, it was not Jesus who baptized, but His disciples. 
So he left Judea and went back once more to Galilee. Now he had to go through Samaria, so he came to a town in Samaria called Sychar. Near the plot of ground Jacob was, had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well. It was about noon. When a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, Will you give me a drink? His disciples had gone into town to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, You are a Jew, and I am a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? For Jews do not associate with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it was that asked you for a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. Sir, the woman said, You have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. Where can you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us the well and drank from it himself, as did also his sons and his livestock? Jesus answered, Everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. There's a type of well, there's a type of water that we can draw and drink from that doesn't last very long. But there's a thing that happens when we drink of Jesus. There's a thing that happens when we drink the living water. And inside of us, is a, it becomes a well. See, without the well, you're always going to some other source to fill yourself up. Repeatedly, you have to go to this source to fill yourself up. But a well is a source. And so not only do you have this source of living water inside of you so that you don't get thirsty again, it's a well that other people can draw from. It's a resource for others and a source for people who are thirsty. I want to be like Jesus. I want to be a resource for other people. I want to be a source that people can draw from. I want to splash that water all around me as I'm living my life. I want to get some people wet. You guys remember the old Keith Green song? I've got a river of life flowing out of me. Makes lame to walk and the blind to see. Opens prison doors, lets the captives free. I've got a river of life flowing out of me. Spring up the old well, splish, splash, then my soul. Spring up the old well, splish, splash, make me whole. Spring up the old well and give to me that life abundantly. Amen? Father, we love you. We desire you. We want you to be a living well within our lives, Lord. Give us that river of life that flows from our, our hearts into other people's lives, Lord. We desire you in Jesus' name. Amen? Amen. Amen.